welcome everybody. We are going to get started because we have a lot to do today. We are very excited about today's message and presenter. My name is Charlene Margo and I'm the founder of the Parent Education Series and co-founder of nonprofit The Parent Venture with my partner Bev Hartman, who's working the chat today. We are delighted to have you with us today. And I think that I can safely say the digital media literacy is an incredibly important topic for this time, especially given the social and political events of the day. So I'm just really glad that we managed to get this event scheduled. Our speaker is a very busy lady and we are happy to have her with us. So um, before I get going, if you would like Spanish interpretation, we have with us interpreter Cynthia Hinesterosa. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a globe icon. If you click on the globe and then Spanish, you will hear this program in Spanish. It is being recorded in English and will be available on our video library YouTube channel. All right, um, special thanks today to our presenter, Michelle Chula Lipkin, the executive director from NAMLI. I'm gonna be telling you a little bit more about her in a minute, but she is coming to us today from New York City. So thank you, Michelle. This is one of the great silver linings of the pandemic that we have been able to reach people from across the country and even around the globe to bring you wonderful parent education series programming. So thank you, Michelle. Awesome, hope you're having a good day in New York. Our sponsors today are the Menlo Atherton PTA, the Sequoia Union High School District, Sequoia Healthcare District, Peninsula Healthcare District, and our nonprofit, The Parent Venture. We would not be here without your partnership and sponsorship, so thank you, everybody. Um, a little bit about today's format. Michelle will be speaking to you for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to you, the audience, for questions and answers. In the chat, you will see links to relevant information about this program, about our video library, about NAMLI, and then we would like you to put your questions in the Q&A box if you could. Uh, we want to get to as many of your questions as we can, so try to keep them brief so that we can answer lots of them. Michelle will call me back in about 30 minutes after her remarks. She has a beautiful slide deck. I know you're really going to enjoy this. So again, recording will be available on our video library. I just want to give a shout out to that resource. It is free. We have had more than 18,000 views in the last couple of years since we started it, including 15,000 of you watching videos since COVID. So again, we know that this is an important and popular resource. Um, our next event's coming up on Tuesday, May 4th from 6 to 8 p.m. San Mateo County Office of Education is showing the documentary film, Angst, Raising Awareness About Anxiety. We hope you will join us for that. Again, Angst on May 4th. It is free for residents of San Mateo County. And on Friday, May 7th at 12 noon, we have Madeline Pisey from Mission B speaking about reducing COVID stress and anxiety for parents. Madeline is a mindfulness educator. So again, hope to see you for both of those events. All right, let me tell you a little bit more about our presenter today. Michelle Chula Lipkin is the executive director of the National Association for Media Literacy Education. She has helped Namley grow to be the preeminent media literacy education association in the United States. She launched the first ever Media Literacy Week in the US, now in its seventh year, and developed partnerships with companies such as Facebook, Twitter, and Nickelodeon. Some of you in the Bay Area will recognize those names. Michelle was the recipient of the 2020 Global Media and Information Literacy Award given by UNESCO. And in 2020, she appeared in the documentary, Trust Me, as well as the PBS documentary, Fake. She earned both her undergraduate and graduate degrees from New York University, where in her graduate work, she focused on children and television and caught the media literacy bug. She is currently an adjunct lecturer at Brooklyn College, where she teaches media literacy. Please join me in a really warm virtual welcome for Michelle Chula Lipkin. Take it away, Michelle. Thank you so much. I'm gonna share my screen and get uh, this show started. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm so excited to be here and to talk to you about media literacy. 
Um, it's, it's just a real honor to, to have an opportunity to bring some of my thoughts to all of you. Um, so I want to just say up front that the goal of this conversation is ultimately to give you some tips and tools to go from kind of incredibly exasperated <laughs> to a little bit more calm and zen about media and technology and your kids, um, which might not be totally doable in only 45 minutes, but we are gonna try. Um, so as Charlene mentioned, I run Namely and have run Namely since 2012, but I think it's probably most important to let you know that I have a 16 and an 18 year old. So not only am I doing uh, th a lot of thinking about media and technology in my job, I do it a lot with my kids also. Um, so Namely has been around in some formation since 1997, and we're actually the largest membership organization for media literacy around the globe. And we spend every single day working towards a vision to see media literacy highly valued and widely practiced as an essential life skill. And just so everyone knows, what is media literacy? Hopefully you've heard the term before, but this is how we define it. So media literacy is the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, create, and act using all forms of communication. And so in its simplest terms, media literacy builds upon the foundation of traditional literacy. So when we think about what does it mean to be a literate person in today's world, we're really talking about kind of authoring, consuming, you know, with all of our communication devices. And the purpose of media literacy is to make sure we are all able to develop the habits of inquiry, skills of expression, that we need to be critical thinkers, effective communicators, and active citizens in today's world. So really, if you think about the digital world we live in and the kind of the media saturated world we live in, to become a successful student, a responsible citizen, a conscientious consumers, we really need to develop that expertise with the media world that surrounds us. And, and media literacy represents a kind of a necessary and realistic response to that complex, ever-changing information landscape. So what does it look like to be media literate? What does a media literate person do? So a media literate person is going to be curious and skeptical and inquisitive about all the messages that they see and create every day. Um, they're going to ask questions about everything all the time, have their ears and eyes wide open. Um, they also understand that media messages, all of them have a point of view. And they, they really understand that media influences our beliefs and our behaviors. And most importantly, a media literate person is always thinking and always seeking the answer to how do I know what I know, you know? And especially if I don't even know what I don't know, right? So let's frame the problem. So think about it this way. We can talk about this problem in the how do we keep kids safe? Or we can talk about it and how do we prepare kids for success? And you probably know, and you might even be here today because you've been um, hearing and talking about that first question. And we tend to spend a lot of time in our culture around that first question. And I would say that we are, I'm just gonna say it, we're spending a little bit too much time in that conversation and we're limiting the possibilities available to our children and each other when we focus just on safety. If we're really thinking about preparing kids for the world that they're going to live, work and lead, then we're also gonna keep them safe. If we're only thinking about how to keep them safe, we're missing a lot of possibility and opportunity. Um, so we can ask the question, how do we prepare kids for success? But we could also ask a different kind of question that actually has us involved as adults. And it's how do we create a healthy, balanced relationship with media and technology in the home? 
So we often think about media and technology as a youth issue, as something we're concerned about for our youth. And we forget that we too are living in this world and we too are struggling and learning and growing in this mediated environment. And so we need to think um, a little bit more deeply about our role with media and technology if we wanna support our kids with media and technology. So media literacy provides skills to thrive in the mediated world. And we talk about media literacy, really effective media literacy empowers, engages, and really allows for full participation in society. And think for one second, um, when you were helping your kids learn to read. So, um, as I said before, if you think about media literacy as an expansion of the definition of literacy, you can kind of see that as a parent, we are constantly assisting our kids with learning to read, right? You, these pictures that you see here on the screen, we always see this image of the parent and the child and the book, right? It's a side-by-side -side, um, together opportunity. And for whatever reason, when it comes to technology, we separate ourselves from assisting, from helping, from guiding our children. And if we thought about media literacy like literacy, we would probably look at our role in that process differently. So this is a quote that I love from um, an article in the Atlantic from a few years ago that says, it's not our job as parents to put away the phones. It's our job to take out the phones and teach our kids how to use them. And that again is envisioning that this, this um, process or this journey with media and technolo technology in the home is one that parents and children need to go through together. So the way that I frame the tips and tools around this is with six E's and they are exemplify, explain, engage, educate, empower, and empathize. So let's start with exemplify. So I have a 16 and 18 year old and I know that my children watch me way more than they listen to me, right? They're watching what I'm doing more than they're really listening to what I'm saying. So what we have to recognize as parents, as adults kind of navigating this world is that we have to ask ourselves some really reflective questions, right? So what's your relationship with media and technology? What are your thoughts and beliefs about media and technology? How do you manage your consumption? Most specifically, how do you manage your news consumption? What are kids learning about that? How do you balance your time? How do you stay physically and mentally healthy, right? We often hear parents worry about their kids' balance, right? They're on technology too much. They're not getting enough physical activity. Well, what about you? How are you doing that? And how can that show your kids how to do that? How often do you share about your family or children on social media? So we often talk to our kids, especially our kids that are in middle school and high school who are really starting to share themselves on social media. We tell them to be very, very careful. Um, and then we hear now about a lot of children that are going on social media accounts for the first time, realizing that their parents have been sharing about them their whole lives. So what does that say to your child? How are we teaching them about our thoughts and values by the way we behave? And then are we following the same standards that we expect of our children? I know, are you struggling like binging Netflix shows and watching too many TikToks at night like I am? You know, they know that. And so they understand if we are telling them to find balance or find um, other activities that, you know, they're gonna label us as hip hypocrites, right? And, and teenagers are hypocrisy radars, right? That's all they're looking for. So we need to be really careful about what we're, what we're exemplifying. The next E is thinking about explain. So I mean this when I say that we can never, ever, 
ever talk about media and technology too much. It is such a huge part of our lives. We are spending so much time with it and we should be in open dialogue with our kids about it all the time. And when I say explain, I'm talking about being clear with your kids on what your expectations are, what are your guidelines, and more importantly, what are your values? Um, so many problems that I have seen and explored with parents and their kids really come when we aren't clear about our rules and we don't follow up on our rules or our expectations. And then kids are you know, surprised when they get um, either punished or talked to because we've never really had these conversations with them. You probably have an incredible amount of thoughts on media and technology and you should talk to your kids about them. And more importantly, you should let your kids talk to you. So I've spoken to countless media, you know, media, media, countless middle schoolers and high schoolers about media and technology. And the thing that I've always noticed is that their concerns and their fears are the same as ours. But instead of talking with them, we're talking at them. And there has to be this dialogue or we're not going to get anywhere. And they have a lot of explaining that they can do to you, do for you too, right? So they, you might understand kind of having, how to navigate the world and personalities and, um, you know, uh, difficult social situations. They might know technology better than you, right? Kids are really savvy with technology. So explain the things that you're expert in to each other right? And um, having that back and forth can really, really be valuable, especially as they get older. Um, and another way, especially with like younger kids, middle school or even earlier, is instead of thinking about um, and explaining in terms of how much time, you know, the screen time debate is really one that from the media literacy perspective is really not worth having, uh, having because all content is not created equally. And you, know, you can have a child that plays an hour of a very violent video game and then another child who's on you know, YouTube baking channels for two hours and you can't compare that experience. Um, so instead of talking about you know, the rules of how much time, there are ways to kind of you know, think about things that they can do all the time, like talking to their grandparents on FaceTime, like who would stop, who would stop their kids from doing that? When, you know, you might not want your kid to be, you know, playing video games in bed right before they're supposed to go to sleep and explaining the difference between those things, you know, and why they, why you might have different rules about them. So talk, talk and keep talking about media and technology. And then when you're done talking, play with them. And I'm talking, I'm not talking about like, you know, play with young kids. I'm talking about engaging with our kids around technology because research shows that how we engage with our kids around technology and media is more important which than how much time they spend on it. So think about when your kids were young, again, just like when we were reading next to them they started showing an interest in soccer or they started showing an interest in music or they started showing, you know, just passion about Legos. Like, what did you do? You played with them, right? You engaged with them. And we need to do that with media and technology. Um, and if you think about that in terms of like the older, you know, the older kids, if I think about how do I engage with my 16 and 18 year old, you know, I, you know, am, I have a, all the accounts. I'm on TikTok, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, Instagram. I love social media. I think it's a really powerful tool. Um, so when I see something funny on one of those um, platforms, I'm gonna share it with my children. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna either just text it to them or we're gonna talk about it at the dinner table and we're gonna engage around it. If we see a film that we love, we're gonna talk about it. If we um, hear music that we're really excited about, we're gonna share it. And having that back and forth and engaging with your children around media and technology keeps that dialogue open, but also gives you so many things of um, 
so many possibilities for shared interests, right? So many options for together time. And that's really, really important, especially as your kids get older. Um, and it also engaging with them in some ways also allows you to have some of the tougher conversations with you because you're not gonna get anywhere with kids if you vilify technology all the time. If the only conversation you're having about technology is about what they shouldn't do or rules, you're not gonna get anywhere with them. If you can show them that you engage with media, that you enjoy media, that you have lots of good to say about um, media content that you um, kind of navigate or look at, you know, they're gonna be more open to having you know, more serious conversations when those serious conversations are needed. And then educate. So educate is one that really is where the media literacy um, really kicks in. So what we wanna do is we wanna teach our kids how to ask questions. And this was, you know, right from the start in the definition of media literacy and the purpose of media literacy, teaching them how to question media, talking to them about everything from, you know, advertising to algorithms, you know, ensuring that you're kind of preparing them to navigate the world rather than just trying to keep them safe. Um, again, you know, prepare versus protect, it's a totally different frame. And asking, um, you know, asking questions around media, I know that I drove, I drove my kids crazy doing this when they were watching their Disney shows as they were growing up or they saw a toy commercial that really was kind of misleading, you know, so but having those, having that dialogue, teaching them how to, you know, pause and wonder is really, really important, especially in the complicated information landscape that we're living in. And, and that uh, brings me to kind of a, an education point uh, myself. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we've been in information since 1997. And it wasn't until 2016 um, that media literacy education was really launched into the cultural conversation. And that was thanks to the amplification of the term fake news. And I've seen, you know, media literacy go from kind of a concept in uh, academic conferences to, you know, talking about it on, you know, conferences like this, right, uh, in webinars like this. Um, and it's really important that we have some information about fake news and mis and disinformation. It's a it's a huge part of the public conversation right now, um, and you know one of the reasons is because false information has a seventy percent greater chance of being disseminated than the truth, and and that's because you know fake news disinformation is created to stir up emotions and the human brain, we are triggered by emotional information. Um, and this has certainly <laughs> proved to be a problem that has real life consequences as we've seen over the years. Um, but an important media literacy point that I wanna make is that that's not the only problem with fake news. And one of the reasons that fake news is problematic, or I should say that the conversation around fake news is problematic is because it forces information into just two buckets. And sometimes those buckets are true versus false. Sometimes it's real versus fake. Sometimes it's fact versus fiction. But the problem is, is that information is complicated. And very often media literacy I'm sorry, information cannot fall into um, one or two buckets. And that's where media literacy comes in. Um, that we have to think of things like, you know, uh, the endless buckets of news and opinion and advertising and entertainment and satire and humor. Um, you know, even if we think just about misinformation, we could talk about propaganda, we could talk about clickbait, we could talk about hoaxes and conspiracy theories or disinformation or just inaccuracies that we see, right? So we limit our understanding of information if we just put like a binary label on it, right? We're missing out on deeper understanding and just to stress that it's, it's that deeper understanding that is the goal of media literacy, right? It's, it's about 
the purpose of information, the value of that information, who the audience of that information is supposed to be. What is the bias of the creators? What is the bias of the audience? What is the agenda, right? So we are striving to think deeper, to understand how we are influenced by media and technology and how those things really impact our beliefs, our values, our relationships. So the way that I like to look at it is that, that media literacy is a GPS to guide you through the complicated media landscape around you. And that's these are the conversations that you could be having with your kids when they come in and they hear of a story, um, when they share something they either saw on the news or heard in class. You know, there are so many ways to bring in media literacy in the dialogue that we have around our homes uh, at our dinner tables. So then looking at empower. So this is kind of astounding for those of you who are seeing it for the first time, but 65% of children today will work in jobs that don't exist. So I always like to ask our, you know, ourselves, like, what are we preparing kids for? Like, what are we preparing them for if we don't even know what's ahead for them? And what we wanna do is empower kids to learn about technology and about future technology. Um, these are things that they're going to need to know. And just like I use the example of when your child, you know, determined they love soccer or love theater or love Legos, you know, we kind of do we leaned into that, right? We said, oh, let me find a theater class. You know, we don't always do that with technology. We don't always do that with kids that are like big gamers or love to take photos. You know, empower them to learn these skills, empower them to understand how to edit video, empower them to understand how to do graphic design. These are skills that they are going to be required to have and we need to empower them. Um, I often think it's so funny how maybe funny is not the word, but it's interesting how we constantly push back on teenage use of social media. And then as soon as they go into the workforce, we expect them to know a lot about social media. Um, I won't hire someone who can't help me with our social media um, presence. So it's like, again, what are we preparing our, our kids for and empowering them to be lifelong learners, to be curious, to be interested in the future of technology is so vital. And then the last, um, the last E is empathize. Um, so I can't imagine that there is one person here that is on this webinar right now that would co go back to middle school, first of all, that would go back themselves to middle school, but would hope that there was more digital, like photo and video content of them in middle school, right? You know, those are, there's a lot of stuff in there that I will never want to remember. And I think that we forget that it is really, really hard to navigate the world the way that our kids are trying to navigate the world. Um, uh, a scholar, um, Dana Boyd, talks about kind of the public and private framing. And we grew up in a private space and we would have to kind of navigate it in such a way to be more public. And it's the exact opposite now for, for our kids. They are growing up in public and they have to try so hard to find some privacy. And, you know, we could have a whole nother webinar of just, you know, the value of privacy and what it even means today to them versus us. But the idea that they're doing it in public brings with it some real struggles and some real conflict. And we should empathize with them about that. You know, we, and sometimes we forget to empathize because we are so caught up in not feeling like we know what to talk about when it comes to technology or feeling like, you know, we don't understand the world today. And I can tell you that, you know, the first time your 14 year old daughter, you know, goes on her Instagram feed and finds that all her friends are hanging out without her, it's a difficult moment. And you might be able, you might say, oh, I don't understand that. I didn't have Instagram, but you do understand it because you know what it's like to feel left out. And that's the conversation you need to have with your child at that moment. 
And so I think making sure that we can remember that it isn't easy to navigate identity building and you know finding your relationships and your friendships all in public. Um, you know, obviously there's opportunities there too, especially for kids that who can find, you know, people who are like-minded and people who really enjoy the same things as them. There's obviously opportunities there, but there are some real struggles there that we need to be there for our kids um, around and recognizing that it's hard. Um, I know watching my 16 and 18 year old navigate the pandemic and navigate the news and navigate, you know, all of this information that I would have loved to protect them from, um, you know, that's hard stuff. And, and, and making sure that we're there to talk with them, I think is such an important part of how we can parent and guide our children. So again, we're looking at empathizing, we're looking at empowering, we're looking at um, explaining and educating and exemplifying. Um, and I'm hoping that some of this makes you realize that you do have some skills, you know, as a parent in how to, you know, your kid, you know what they need. Um, and I'm hoping that it makes you feel a little bit more relaxed and zen and taking a couple of deep breaths about technology and media in the home. I want to tell you, um, we're going to go to questions. I'm going to invite Charlene to come back. I think I'm a little less than 30 minutes, but hopefully that means that we'll have more time to talk. Um, but please um, take my information down. I'm going to stop sharing my screen in a sec just because I really um, want to be able to um, I'm just going to focus on what Charlene's telling me, um, but please take my information down and feel free to reach out. I do love always talking to parents about, about these important topics. Well, thank you, Michelle. That was really amazing. I think I, like probably a lot of parents, have been watching the special 50 Years of Sesame Street. Mm. And I think about what your friend David Kleeman, who's with us today, who yes. spoke a month ago, said is that children and adolescents are still developing in the same way. Yes. The, the tools and the toys may change, but as you said, it's an adaptation. You know what it feels like to be left out of a party. You know what it feels like to not get invited to the birthday, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you say? Um, so we have some great questions coming in, Michelle. Uh, a couple from an educator, and we love having teachers and educators in these events. You are one of our prime audiences, so thank you for asking. Here's a good one for you as a mom, Michelle. Mm -hmm. What rules do you have for your kids, and were the rules something you created together? Ooh, that's a good question. So my kids are 16 and 18 um, right now, so there's not a whole bunch of rules, but I can tell you that I had a roadmap um, from when they were young that very clear rules. My kids got flip phones to start. <laughs> they had to learn how to text and they had to learn how to plug in their phone and take care of it before I was spending money on a smartphone. Um, they didn't need internet access, right? So I had, there was a lot of kind of a, there was a roadmap map we followed. And I think the major, major rules that we had um, with my kids growing up was one was no technology at the dinner table um, and no uh, charging in bed uh, in your bedroom at night. Those were two that stuck until about a year ago. Um, and that was because um, one, I wanted a, a, I wanted a time during every day that we were just talking with each other and not distracted by technology. And that was a rule that we all followed, right? So it wasn't like I had my phone, at, like none of us could have our phone. Um, and then charging in the, um, in the living room was just a really, really important practice for me also, um, is just to separate ourselves from our devices. And I think that we all know, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we all know that kids don't, teens especially don't get enough sleep. And I wanted to just, it wasn't really about them not being on technology as much as that I, I wanted them to have um, a restful night's sleep. And so that was, that was practice. Um, and so a lot of those, a lot of my rules were, were really more about 
how do we create a healthy relationship? You know, obviously I spoke at length with my kids about behavior and, you know, how we want to be online and, and, um, but my kids are also very, very creative and they've used social media and technology in very creative ways. So I've tried to, in general, tried to talk to my kids about what to do as opposed to what not to do. Um, yeah, so I think that that's a good framing also. Well, and I really appreciated your opening slide that talked about how the focus is so often on safety, which is really the questions we most get from parents versus what are we preparing our kids for? What is success? If we don't know what 65% of the jobs are, then what are we doing, right? How yeah. are, we, are we educating? So, yeah, and I think I just want to stress that I don't think, I'm not saying that safety isn't important. What I'm saying though, is if we're educating them, that comes with it, right? Like that, you know, we're not ignoring the risks by talking about the opportunities, but we're not getting anywhere if all we're talking about is the risks. Exactly. And, and parents, again, just to caution, as Michelle said, um, you probably know our friend Devorah Heitner, Michelle. Mm -hmm. She's who, awesome. Yeah, who founded Raising Digital Natives. And she said, remember, it's very important, as Michelle mentioned, that you start out training your kids, hopefully with the device where they're just learning about texting. But as time moves on, if you do decide to track your kids or you do decide to check their phones, be sure they're a part of the conversation. Oh, yeah. Because if you don't, and you find something, then what do you do? Oh yeah, don't lie to your kids. <laughs> like that's the thing. It's like if you feel like for a while my kids knew that I was, you know, when they were real young, they knew that I was gonna check their texts. And then there was a period of time where I just did like drive-bys and I just like surprised them to say, hey, give me your phone, you know? And it was like that's how we loosened it up. And then at some point you have to trust, right? That you've taught them every, just like with driving cars, like at some point they drive by themselves, but you feel confident because you've done it so many times with them that you know that your voice is in their head. Um, but I do, I do think that that, um, I don't know, that, con that kind of roadmap I keep bringing up is just like knowing that you're preparing them so that you're not, you shouldn't be tracking your child when they're 17, I'm sorry. Like by then they re really, really should feel comfortable, co confident and comfortable that they have the skills they need. Yes, and also because they're probably, we hope, gonna be heading off to college or heading yeah. into work and then they're gonna need to manage themselves and their technology, yeah. right? Yeah. That's one of the reasons that like, you know, from a media balance standpoint, I think, you know, I, you know, some, some restrictive tools might be helpful when the kids are very, very young, but the goal is to teach your children how to, you know, regulate themselves and to teach them to know, you know, what feels right to them. I mean, my son, um, goes on and off and like, he'll take huge breaks from Instagram because he's just like, just don't want to do this right now and allowing him to make those choices and realizing what's comfortable and not comfortable, I think is really important. And if we keep restrictions on them or we're, you know, are too, you know, too controlling about tracking, whatever, we're not teaching them anything. Like the point is, is you want to teach them that independence and just like we do with, we would, you know, just like we do when we give them the their car or give them the keys to ours. <laughs> exactly. And I think that, you know, at least what I'm seeing is some of the young adults, my own kids are 30 and 33. They have stopped social media. Mm -hmm. My 30 year old daughter gave it up completely. I do think that teenagerhood is this part where they are so wrapped up in it, but things do change moving forward. Do you see that too? Yeah. I mean, I think what's interesting. So I teach at Brooklyn college and um, I teach a course that is most often taken by juniors and senior undergrad juniors and seniors. So what they're usually 21 or 22. And in my um, first day of class survey, one of the questions that I ask always is what's your preferred form of communication? And without a doubt, the majority of them say face-to-face. -face. They do. Sure, yeah. Yeah. That is a they, very encouraging sign. Yeah. They'd much rather, I mean, and I, you know, the truth is, is that's going to, you know, certainly, and that was before COVID, like now everyone is just desperate to be in person. So I think that, you know, you know, having is, is, you know, teen, they're trying to find themselves, they're trying to figure it out. So of course they're going to, 
you know, they're social beings. So, and I brought up Dana Boyd before and I'll bring her up again. Like she always talks about how teens are not addicted to these things. They're addicted to their friends. They're addicted to yeah. their peers. And yeah. this is how we, how we get there, you know? Um, and also like, you know, as a culture, we don't, we don't look fondly on teens without a lot to do. You know, we see teens gathering and we're like, oh, what's going on? Something bad must be going on. So we don't provide them any public freedom and space. And then we're surprised when we find them on social media all the time, trying to, you know, get that experience of social interaction that they're so craving. Um, and I think that we just, we don't recognize that, that in some ways our culture is kind of forcing them onto the screen in some ways, because we're not giving them the free time and the social life that they might want. Um, so interesting. Somebody needs to study like the connection between cell phones and how we've taken away all the kids gathering places. We don't have, you know, Silicon Valley real estate so expensive. They've plowed under all the mini golf courses and bowling alleys. Yeah. Uh, there's no places for kids to go. And then we're like, oh, why are they on their phones all the time? Well, why do we think they're on the phones all the time? Like they're finding each other. They're talking. Yeah. I mean, think about when I was young, I used to talk to my best friend every single night on yeah. the phone for an hour. We never had anything to talk about. <laughs> we did it for an hour every night. So it's like, it, you know, we just have to recognize it. it. Just It might look different, but what they're seeking is that social life and that engagement with their peers. Such an important point. All right, here's a good question, another from um, our educator. You mentioned having conversations with middle school and high school students. What are some of your favorite discussion opening questions? Well, I love um, asking students what they wish adults knew about social media and what they wish they knew about technology. Yeah. Um, I, it's a very reflective question and I think, um, it's a really good conversation starter. Um, I also, you know, just simply what is your favorite thing about social media and what is your least favorite thing? And what's so interesting is so often those things are somewhat related like this. I remember so poignantly one ninth grader saying that her favorite thing was being able to share who she was and her least favorite thing was having to share who she was, you know? And that to me, is just like speaks to the conflict of this, you know, demographic. Um, so really letting, I think it's really, really important to let them reflect on their, um, their use, their relationship with media and how they would like to see adults in their life interact with them. Um, and really letting them talk about it, right? Instead of us talking at them. It's, it's unbelievable when the reaction I get from students when they're like, wait, we're allowed to tell you all these things that are good about it, or that we're allowed to talk about the things that we love, um, because I think we have too much of a protectionist conversation about it most often in schools. Well, and you mentioned about leaning into it with kids. You know, I think about, um, my friend who started one of the founders of my digital tattoo, who said, her son said, he's a gamer. He said, you know, mom, you never ask me anything, but you go to all my brother's soccer games. Mm -hmm. Why don't you ever ask me about what I do online? So yeah, we devalue it a lot. We devalue it and we, um, yeah, we don't engage. It's, it's fascinating. It's, that's a great anecdote. It's a great story. I might share that at some point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's a question, both one in Spanish and one in English about resources for different age groups. Are there things on your Namely site or other resources that you'd like to recommend to help our kids learn about media literacy? Absolutely. So I can say that our, um, our membership is free. So anyone can sign up to be a Namely member. Now our members, um, we tend to share a lot about um, informal and formal education spaces, like not direct um, parenting materials, but some of our partners do um, really strong work with parents. So um, you mentioned Raising Digital Natives. They have a great website and a great newsletter. Um, CyberWise is another one that has really, really strong materials and strong resources for parents. I'm sure most of you know Common Sense. They have great materials and really relevant um, 
uh, resources for parents and timely. Um, and then Joan Gans Cooney Center is um, associated with Sesame Workshop and they have just really good, um, they look at kind of the relationship between um, dig, you know, digital technology and children and they just do really important work to understand that relationship. And so if you're interested in learning more about it, I highly recommend them. There's just, there's, a, there's so many resources out there um, in this space that allow you to have an empowering relationship with media. And I would obviously suggest seeking those out um, because, you know, again, the framing of empowerment is just, I think, so much more impactful. So we have a parent who says she is really all about limiting or minimal technology in their home. She actually just gave her 17 year old his first phone, which is an anomaly in today's world. Do you have any advice for parents who are minimal advocates? She, I think, feels like it's been hard to, to hold that value. Yeah, no, I think it's very difficult. I mean, I think it's it's quite difficult to have that conversation and I'm not trying to like pass off on the answer because each kid in each home is very, very different. And that's one of the reasons that anytime I talk about tips or tools, I don't get too specific because I don't know your family. I don't know your kid. I don't know your value system. Um, I think that I, what I would ask someone, right? Like if, if I had a parent come to me who was, who had a 15 year old who, she, you know, she or he said, I do not want to give my child um, a cell phone until they're a senior in high school. The questions that I would ask would be why, like, what, what are we like really understanding that choice? Why, why, why? And really trying to understand how the child feels at that age. I believe that a child should be with has um, has a, not a necessarily a say you're the parent, but has a voice and we need to make sure their voice is heard. There are some children that don't care. There are some children that are like, I don't care, I don't need a phone. But if your child is the one that really, really wants that engagement, really, really wants that, then you really owe it to them to understand why. And you need to have that conversation with them. And there is no doubt that not having social media and having not having phone in a high school can impact your social life. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Um, that isn't a great thing, but it's the truth. So I think that you really, you know, I just, I think you really need to look at the whole picture and you need to look at your child and you need to, to look at what they're gaining or missing from not having technology. But I think if you are one of those, you know, one of those families that really, really, really don't want to have a huge relationship with technology in your home, then that's where the exemplify comes in also. You know, that is where, you know, you, uh, you're the family that are leaving their phones at home when they go to restaurants. Like you're exemplifying that. That to me is, you know, more impactful than just saying to your kid, you can't have a phone, right? It's just like, and then do you have a phone and why do you get to have a phone and your 16 year old doesn't get to have a phone? Like, so you really need to understand why you need to understand if it's totally based on fear or whether there's values there that really make sense. Are you communicating that to your kid? Does that, do he, she, or they understand, you know, it's a complicated thing. Well, and we had a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Anna Lemke from Stanford, Michelle, and she talked about the neuroscience of addiction, specifically with regard to technology. She was featured in the social media film. She herself- The social dilemma. The social dilemma, thank you, yes. So she herself is an expert in addiction, teaches at Stanford, runs the addiction clinic, talks to Congress, does not have a smartphone, does not mm -hmm. want a smartphone. So mm -hmm. people do make their choices. So she's yeah. not doing what it feels like for her with teenagers. Yeah who have a made a different choice, right? Yeah, I think just understanding, I think part of the issue, parents don't necessarily understand 
or don't necessarily explain enough as to why they make the decisions that they make. And so their yeah. kids end up frustrated and confused. Um, that happens a lot with younger kids, like not knowing like why that the iPad was taken away at that very moment, just because mom decided I had had enough. Like that's so confusing to a six year old. And so it's like recognizing that, like if you're having, you know, dialogue um, and you're being really, really clear about why, um, why you're making the limiting choices that I just think it's really important. And that's where the five E, the six E's come in, like the explaining and talking and talking about it. Yeah, such a good point, Michelle. Here's another resource question and then we'll ask one more and wrap for today. Um, can you recommend a good book of articles for teaching college freshmen? Mm -hmm. I would open that question up a little bit to say, what books do you recommend for parents? I like Devorah Heitner's book. Yeah. Wise, and I yeah. like Anya Kamenetz's book from NPR. Are there some others you like, especially for older kids that a student might read as well as a parent? So I love um, Diana Graber's book. Um, wait, I'm looking for it on my shelf. It's called, uh, Raise, no, it's not Raising Digital Natives. It's Raising Digital Citizenship Citizens. I'm going to follow up with resources. But so Renee Hobbs is one of the leading scholars in media literacy. And this book just came out media literacy in action. And it's one of, um, I'm going to say it's the best textbook around media literacy that I've ever seen. <laughs> and I'm likely going to adopt it in my class. And so I think if you're asking me for freshman undergrad, this is your book. There's also a wonderful book about teaching media literacy written by Faith Rogo and Cindy Scheib. That's a kind of a professional development tool for parents. Um, but Bottom line, if you are looking for resources to teach media literacy, you must become a member of our organization. Every single month, we send out three emails that are like chock full of resources. We have a national conference coming up, um, the and it's about the intersection of media literacy and social justice. We have Media Literacy Week. Like there are so many ways for you to get involved as a teacher. Um, please, please become a member. All right, thank you, parents and educators, you got that. And we also will send out a follow-up email with a couple of these resources, including um, the link to Namely is in the chat. David Kleeman put it there and Bev probably put it there as well. Okay, last question for you, uh, Michelle, and this is a question I borrowed from my friend Becky Beacom, former health engagement manager at Palo Alto Medical Foundation. And that is given everything we're looking at today, with the struggles around fake news and misinformation, what gives you hope for our kids? Oh, I am so hopeful. Like I have to say that like, I am in the category of just feeling really, really good about this generation of youth. Like they are so civically engaged. They are so socially conscious. They are, they are thoughtful and kind and open and, um, I just feel incredibly hopeful for, um, for their ability to lead um, the world. You know, they are um, sensitive and kind and just really, really open generation. And I do think that, you know, we don't see the incredible stories of social media victories and social media use to create art, to create social movements, to connect people. And there's so much of that happening and it doesn't, it doesn't end up in the news because it's not newsworthy. Um, but we do have to remember that that is happening when all of this other stuff is happening, that there is just moments of pure you know, gold happening on social media every single day with kids. And you know, we can't forget that as we worry about all the other stuff. That is a perfect ending and such wise words, Michelle. Thank you for an amazing presentation. Thank you everybody who contributed to this conversation. We really enjoyed it again. This will be available on our video library shortly. We, speaking of digital media, we work with the students at the Boys and Girls Club to produce our videos and they are the media production team. So it takes them a few days, but That's boy- That's amazing. I know they usually they used to come out to in person events and film and edit. Now they're doing it digitally, but it was just it's our favorite partnership. So again, media production by the Boys and Girls Club. Thank you. Thank you, everybody for joining us. Take care, stay well, and we'll see you again soon. Bye bye. Thank you.